So you know about modern horror, right? That sort of bait-and-switch horror where it looks kind of like a cute kid's game before getting really dark. Games like Harvest Festival, Shipwrecked, and even Baldi's Basics fall under this category. But they aren't real. While all these games are spooky, they aren't something you'd accidentally give to your wee bab in their youth. And even if you did accidentally give it to somebody, they always seem to have this warning like DDLC does, where it lets the user know just in case they really did come across it on accident that the game is a horror game and isn't suitable for younger audiences. But what if I told you that not only was there a game like that, that, with dark themes wrapped up hidden away in a kid's game, but that it was my childhood favorite. And not only that, it was real. It wasn't a horror game. It wasn't anything like that. It had all of these different odd themes you wouldn't expect to see in a kid's game in a kid's game. Now, before I even start to tell you what this game is, I should preface that obviously it's not as blatantly dark as some of the other games I mentioned. Obviously, there aren't any jump scares, trapped souls, or hyper-realistic blood coming from the eyes of Ulu soft boys. But there was a lot of odd things, some I that you could probably pass off as just looking too hard into it, but others that were a lot more blatant, as you'll see. I'm not even ashamed to say this made eight-year-old me cry multiple times as a child. Multiple times. So enough stalling. I'm Spice from Cut Cafe. Let me tell you about the game of my childhood. Pets Dogs 2 for the Nintendo Wii. Now, something I should probably mention is that if you remember this game being called Pets Cats 2, you aren't misremembering things. They pulled a Pokemon here and released the game twice. The only real difference being that all the characters are either dogs or cats. One last little fun fact for you though, this game lets you pick from a total of 40 different dog breeds. However, um, actually, they mislabeled this one as a Jack Russell Terrier when it's technically a Britney Spaniel. You can tell by the dog tail back here and the lack of snout hair. Okay, okay, fine, we'll actually start playing the game now, jeez. We we start off with our father Arvin telling us about a magic hat that's been passed down in our family for generations. It's apparently the cause of all the peace on the island. Suddenly our best friend Victor comes by to invite us to play. They tell us that they want to go see Ivlet, the evil wolf that was recently imprisoned here at the island. However, we're caught by the sheriff who accidentally informs us that Ivlet's only awake at night. So our friend wants to go sneak out later so we can see him awake and moving because curiosity for the sake of plot. Until then though, we play at Dolphin Coast where we learn the basic controls of the game. Moving around, following scents, and catching stuff. Typical dog behavior, I'd know it well. Oh, also, Victor made an OC, Wolfenstein Von Barkley. Wolfenstein Von Barkley is my own creation. He's strong, brave, and cool. Oh, also, quick editor's note here. I was originally playing this for nostalgia and hadn't recorded the first half of the game until I remembered and noticed how dark it actually was. So if you notice there being two saves in the first half of the game, that's why. So we finished that part of the tutorial, and this old lady who's not actually that important to the plot overhears us mention Ivlet and warns us not to talk to him because he's evil. Unfortunately, though, we're stupid. And so we go out that same night, finding Ivlet awake. Ivlet tricks Victor into spilling a bunch of information about the magic hat, like where it's located, who it belongs to, and what it's used for. Thanks, Victor. But all this talk of a magic hat, it's just a pack of lies, right? Heard the magic hat on this island's actually a fake. Sounds to me like this Arvin fellow was lying. No, he isn't, right, player? Ah, I, I know. I just remembered how to tell a fake from the real thing. Just bring the magic hat over here to me, okay? So Victor asks that we just borrow it for a little while. Thanks. Because of peer pressure, we relent, taking the magic hat to him. He then steals it and wrecks havoc on the island, destroying the town, destroying bridges, putting a spell on the animals, all sorts of havoc. And then, we're immediately arrested. Well, the sheriff tells us about how we've doomed everyone and the world's gonna end because of us. Mind you, Victor is not in prison, it's just us. Thanks, Victor! Suddenly, the old lady returns and says that everyone makes mistakes, therefore, I shouldn't be charged. And it works! But Victor demands that he be in prison while I go and fix everything. Great, yeah, now you wanna be in prison. Well, I have to stop what is now a world-ending apocalyptic event. Thanks, Vic! As we leave, we meet Beat, who's apparently the good side of the hat and was kicked out or something? Yeah, he has no real use to the story and I hate him. So we're tasked with helping everyone restore their homes. Most of this is just fetch quests. <laughs> you, you get fet, like, like fet? Yeah, I'll get my coat. So we get a bunch of items to then repair things, like cotton for a roof, flowers for a healing oil, and other such things. Eventually, the fetch Fashion House says they want something called the Legendary Pattern. Apparently a dog named Townsend used to make great clothes and because they're gone, we need to go find their son named Sai. You might be wondering why Townsend is gone and I'll tell you in a second, just be patient with me, all right? We go back to Lappy Lake and make Sai an apple pie and return for the pattern. Now, notice how he's talking about his parents in the past tense here. Well, the thing I neglected to tell you is that Sai's parents are both dead. I'm not implying that either, it's our state they both died of poisoning. Sai brings up how much he misses his parents every 
conversation you have with him too. This isn't just a one-time thing. And he's not gonna let you forget that you have parents and he doesn't. Sai's parents were poisoned to death and he fled the town in grief. Not only that, but nobody checked on him until just now. And it was just to get the pattern out of him. Sai is the same age as our player character, who is often referenced as a child. So this child's parents both died and the whole town just let this child go off and rot. I should also mention that we had to talk to three separate people to figure out where Sai might be after all these years. So don't you dare say in the comments, Oh, they knew where he was and checked in on him from time to time. The old lady even said they barely recognized him. Don't try me on this. Anyways, with that dark plot point out of the way, we do that, get the pattern fixed water wheel, and eventually we go back to site to learn how to call animals for our aid. We return to find that the water has apparently frozen from Ivlet's magic, and we need to go get the warm stone to thaw it out. So we do so. A few fetch quests later, no really this game takes forever to do anything, and we learn how to push things, get the ability to fast travel, as well as a side quest to return all of the zoo animals. Now remember when I said there's major and minor dark things? I'll admit this is one of the more minor ones, but here's the thing. The zoo animals talk and have emotions and thoughts like everyone else. They are indistinguishable from any of the dogs in the village in intelligence and mental maturity. And we return each of them to the zoo where they're treated like real world animals. You know, I didn't expect puppy racism or slavery in my kids games, so that's a yikes for me. Anyways, we apparently have to be taught how to throw rocks because this old lady wants me to attack this innocent crane of whom is the only one in the game who doesn't attack you and is just minding their own business. But anyways, we commit assault and get paid for our assassination job. We're told that we need to stop at Ivlet and that we should find the wizard Theophilus by the windmill in Tail Heights. Unfortunately, the bridge is down and all of the people there have gotten sick, so we need to go get medicine. But the drugstore is out of thyme, so we need to get some thyme to get the cough medicine to get the bridge fixed. So we go to the windmill! Uh, Sai, I think I found what killed your father. We arrived finding that the windmill is held tight by magic vines. Do, can you guess who's gonna have to fix it? We have to go all the way back to talk to the NPC who will allow that specific bug to spawn to fix the problem. So we go find the briar-eating insect. Woo, the magic door is opened. Though for some reason, the wizard's area is surrounded in poison. Not even by Ivlet, so I guess it's just like this normally? We're told to take the path the animals take through the poison, so... So apparently this wizard's just extremely sadistic and likes torturing and poisoning animals for fun because there's no way any of the animals would have just normally taken this path because there's no indication of it. Oh, and spoilers, he fixes the bridge immediately after we make it to him, so it's, it's not like he didn't have the materials or anything. He just likes it that way. The gorilla back there is probably the only survivor of this whole thing. So we're told that Ivla is essentially becoming an eldritch deity and is being consumed by the hat's dark heart. And that if we don't stop it, everyone will die and he will destroy the universe itself. Jesus, this is like Cthulhu, but for dogs. So in order to suppress the magic hat, we need the magic shield, which we can make with three magic crystals. The water crystal on Monolith Isle, the earth crystal at the Inferno Caves, and the ice crystal at Polar Fields. So he finally fixes the bridge, and we go out to see if someone at the docks is willing to hitch us a ride to Monolith Isle. Unfortunately, the lighthouse was destroyed, and while they fix it, they want us to get the lighthouse fuel, which Sai has for some reason. You know, starting to feel like Sai is just stealing these things, so we have an excuse to hang out. Sorry, Sai, but I'm too busy, uh, having parents. Anyway, Swordfish reminded him of his father for some reason, so now we need to go get a Swordfish, which, after 15 minutes, fate decided it was enraged with me today, as I hooked in one Silago, two Silago, three, four, five, Silago? I'm about ready to Silago at you with these hands, boy! You know, I started naming them out of spite. This one's Bob, that one's Sue. Susan, oh look, here comes Uncle Steve. Hi, Uncle Steve. The Silico are in my nightmares. They have stepped into my dreams and I cannot wait. Oh, hey, look, a swordfish, nice. So we give him the tasty swordfish and we get our tasty oil. We commit Grand Theft Doggo and sail off to Monolith Isle. However, we notice that night seems to be lasting a little longer than usual. Apparently, Ivlet cast Eternal Night onto this specific area. Not really sure that's how the moon works, but okay. We're tasked with finding the magic mirror to reverse it, so we sniff it out and after getting 
harassed by some vultures, we snag it from the depths. He then breaks the curse, and in return, he guides us to the bubble cave, where the first crystal is. He moves the stone with the barks of the Jedi, and we're set to go snort some crystals. This place is absolutely crawling with snakes, alligators, and bats, so we have to sneak our way through. At the end of the cave, I realize how creepy it is to give a dog human teeth. But more importantly, we get the crystal and go back to good old Theophilus. Next up, we need to get to the Inferno Caves by sneaking our way through the aptly named Crystal Caves. Again, we sneak through an army of snakes and these brand new kimono dragons. Nice. And we make it to our destination. This worker pup stops us, saying that it'd be just crazy to go out into the Inferno Caverns without a specialty suit. Lucky us, he says he'll make one and that we just need... Komodo dragon skin. Well, I mean, I'm sure that's just fine. I mean, they're lizards. Maybe we'll just sniff out some dead skin that they left. Oh, God, did we just skin them alive? On even sadder note, after you talk to that dog and get this quest to try getting the skin, the Komodo dragon won't attack you. He's just a friendly little guy. He's just vibing and living his life. We just stole his skin. Do you see that face? Do you see that posture? That's not somebody willingly giving us some shed skin. We don't even have a knife or anything like that either. We just tore flesh from his body with our puppy claws. Yeah, another reminder that all of these animals are sentient beings, by the way. Anyways, we get our child-friendly skin suit. I made mine green, because I like green. We delve into the pits of hell, also known as Florida, and we get to sniffing. It's here that a new mechanic is introduced, temperature. Basically, we need to keep ourselves hydrated in order to not die of heat stroke. Bats corner us from all sides as we make our way downtown to Orlando, where we find the fire crystal and become a true Florida man. We take it back to Theophilus again and return to the caverns to find our way to the polar fields and <gasps> oh oh look at the little man oh look at him go oh yep he did it he did the thing okay okay i will say this hedgehogs are cute and all but can we get some mole support moles are cool i mean they're way more fitting in the circumstances i like moles but also at the same time he did a great job that hedgehog is providing and so we arrive at the polar fields once again we are accosted for not wearing the proper outfit for the weather luckily they're willing to give us a hand-me-down so no skinny animals here in return for a ripe coconut which he somehow tells us the scent of despite not having ever seen one we get a ripe coconut though and they give us a warm outfit to use for the polar fields. This time we have to use hot springs to avoid getting hypothermia and before you ask, no, you can't dive heat stroke in the hot springs. Don't worry, I was disappointed too. While we're only doing stuff, I caught a penguin who somehow gave me reindeer horns for catching them. And given the lack of reindeers in this game, I'm just gonna assume that they did the merkin thing of hunting them down to extinction. Thanks, capitalism. So anyways, we snort a white crystal and bring it back to Theophilus. On a side note, he gives us like four grand for that crystal and snoring the crystal now gives us the ability to push all rocks. Unfortunately though, Theophilus doesn't think they can make the magic shield on their own and wants us to go find their brother Bartholomew. Apparently they went to Garongo Peaks 10 years ago and never came back. Y you know, I'm- I'm starting to think there's a pattern here when it comes to not checking on people after an unreasonable amount of time. So we're tasked with finding them. And so we set out to the depressingly named Lonesome Park. We get a cutscene and, and I've and I've lit barks at the sky, but like re really loudly and some dust devils appear and yeah. Okay, bye. We find Bruce who tells us apparently these whirlwinds were cast out a long time ago, but came back because of Ivel a second ago. He wants us to go find the wizard that cast the dust devils away which just so happens to be the same person we're trying to find. He tells us that he was wearing a ring and then tells us what the ring smelled like. D dude, this guy left like 10 years ago and not, not only did you make a point of smelling his paws, but it was so memorable that you still remember the smell of his ring to this day. You know, I think I might know why this place is called Lonesome Park now. But whatever, we run off to Garongo Peaks to go find him. We find a rock which suddenly reverts into a person and hey, it's the guy guy we found uh, hey uh, don't ask why but you might want to be careful that bruce fell I, 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 you don't want to know don't ask how i found you either okay okay apparently he turned himself into a rock for 10 years so he could safely observe other rocks as they fell you know, on second thought, you're both kind of weird. Maybe you and Bruce were made for each other. Anyways, after he's done telling us how rocks make him rock hard, he realizes there's a bunch of tornadoes now. Fortunately, he's too stiff to do anything. So, of course, we're tasked with casting the tornadoes away. We just throw a bunch of rocks at the tornadoes, which, by the way, great idea. Let's let's throw these rocks that can give a full-on gorilla concussion into a spinning vortex. Yeah, I'm sure nothing can go wrong here, right? Yeah. He congratulates us for doing a good job, and we get to see how Ivlet's do. 
doing. It's watching us through the hat somehow, and suddenly the hat's evil side is revealed, and Ivlet's form is corrupted into a Digimon. Oh, also there's a dragon now, because you can't have a 2000s kids game without a dragon. We reunite the brothers, and the two start getting ready to make the shield, though they warn us to only come back when we've done any other side quest we want to do, because that's the end of the game, after we go to defeat the one guy. But alongside this is this really confusing exchange that I do not understand. If you got any unfinished business, I'd suggest you take care of it first. Guess that's what you'd call making fond memories. Oh, ho, ho. I never expected to hear something so romantic from you. I'm not gonna take that as a compliment, you know. That wasn't actually a compliment, you know. What does this even mean? So the portal is open and we get ready to confront the big bad. We get magicked up and Ivlet gets kinda mad cause we trapped his hat. We fight the dragon first, which we have to defeat with pebbles. Y you really couldn't have made a new mechanic just for this fight or, or even just retextured the pebbles to be a more magic-y color or- Oh, oh yeah, right, yeah. Skinning the Komodo took up too much of the budget. Yeah, yeah, you're right, my bad. Sorry. So we stone the dragon to death, and we enter the second stage. Time to fire Ivlet. I'm sure this battle will be legend- Oh, wait, we just pelt him with rocks again? We just pelt him with rocks again. Alright, yeah. Wasn't expecting a cool, dramatic ending boss or anything like that. This was actually slightly challenging, though, mostly because I couldn't pan my camera fast enough to face him before he teleported away or got a good hit in. Eventually, though, I willed him down, gave him one last bark, and he laid down for good. Turning back into your average Animal Jam Deviant ROC, the wizard sent him to Ohio. We bubble out of there back into the real world. He returns to the hat, we congratulate for saving the world, and that his pets, dogs, too. Oh, and also, we didn't see Victor get out of prison, so I'm just gonna assume that with all the evil energy of the island gone, he just kinda disintegrated. Though, I will say that, as I mentioned at the start of the video, my childhood was spent trying to get all the fish, all the fruit, all the bugs. I remember spending a lot of quality time in my youth just obsessively trying to get the golden sunfish from the game. So, for once, I think it's the first time I can genuinely say this, but thanks, Victor. Thanks for the memories.